Hey everyone, welcome to Public on a day where certainly the Bears are having their say. Joining us for a one-on-one -on -one conversation, who better would I rather talk about all the selling across the indexes with than Douglas Bonaparte, longtime friend of the show, uh, president over at Bonafide Wealth. Okay, Douglas, we've got, I mean, I guess kind of take your pick, geopolitics, the Fed and the labor market, uh, big tech missing on revenue on Wednesday and Thursday of last week, late summer seasonality, any of those, anything I missed, what are you attributing uh, this return of volatility to in the markets? Yeah, yeah, you missed you missed uh, Bank of Japan raising rates 25 basis points. We missed the uh, manufacturing data on Friday. What other what other string of bad headlines and tape can we can we throw at this here to really create more noise? Which honestly, this is this is that right? This is the most noise I think we've we've dealt with in in quite some time here. So I'd love. I'd love to talk about all these things, including, you know, why why there's so much noise today as opposed to any other time. Yeah. So so what stands out to you? I mean, as you watch this and you and I were talking before we started the broadcast here um, about all the noise, about the headlines, about how, you know, maybe even regular media outlets that don't frequently cover the indexes are trying to frame this for a very average news consumer. What do you make about how this is being presented and, and how do you see it when you look at the heat index and you see virtually an entire screen of red staring back at you? You know, you, you couldn't have asked for a month plus of new cycle to feed, you know, this kind of noise better than, you know, what we've witnessed over the last four to five weeks from things that are not market related, clearly politics, you know, there was an attempted assassination, there was a presidential candidate dropping out so on the political front, the amount of uncertainty just skyrocketed. And of course, that will get linked over to how the markets are behaving. And then you attach, you know, some some pretty disappointing earnings out of the big tech, which has been the main story for more than a year now as they've expanded and have only gone up, whether you're talking about your NVIDIAs of the world, but you know that Amazon miss wasn't great. Apple kind of looked good here. Uh, Google on its cloud wasn't so great. So uh, you add that to it, throw in the unemployment. We missed that there. So for six people throwing out new rules you didn't hear about, like the SAM rule. And, you know, it's just all of a sudden everyone's screaming for a recession. And it's kind of like all this thing, just all this stuff just converged onto one moment in time here, Friday into Monday. And now you're getting that, that sell off. And, you know, the irony here is that if an alien came to earth and you showed them a five year chart of the S and P 500, they'd really wonder why everybody is, is freaking out. And there's something to be said for that. Like just how noisy these echo chambers have become on social media, mainstream media, almost take your pick. And I'm not sure, that that noise meets the reality of really where we are when you pull back maybe a year, five, even 10 years, you start to really get an understanding of what the story is like in the market. How soon we forget how cyclical things are and that these things happen or the statistics that go into what to expect in any given year. This is, you know, this is not out of bounds as far. I think this is the first time we've actually had a 5% greater pullback in the S&P 500 all year. And you can expect one to three of those in any given year. So, you know, if you just look at that stat right there, you're like, all right, what, what are we, what are we doing here? Yeah, exactly. And, and it's our, you know, our mutual friend, uh, Jay Woods at Freedom Capital, another frequent guest. He's very fond of pointing out, not only do you average maybe one 10% pullback every 12 to 18 months, but every calendar year, you usually get three, five percent pullbacks. So exactly to that point there. Um, and also uh, SPY uh, was overbought in the RSI. It was well over 70 throughout June and July. What were some of the kind of conditions you saw there, Douglas? Keeping in mind that we had market all time highs, not just throughout 2024, but as recently as July 16th. That's not even three weeks ago. What, what? How do you make sense of where we were just a few weeks ago relative to the conversation, the narrative, the sentiment as of this Monday afternoon? Yeah, one of my good friends just texted me one of my favorite like meme templates, which is, you know, stock market crashes, the levels not since, you know, checks notes, June of 2024. Like, you know, you gotta, you gotta love the humor in all of this a little bit. I know I use that all the time, but you know, look, it's, it's froth, right? I think all of those uh, headlines kind of converging in, in a tinderbox environment kind of allowed, you know, the, the Bank of Japan and then that trade, uh, with their rates going up to really kind of set things over the edge here a little bit. Um, but, to your point, you know, look look how long 
you know, this rally has been, you know, we it, it don't have to go back too far in time to a 2022, a very dismal year that set up the, the narrative of we're recession bound in 2023. You know, everyone literally and their mother calling for that 2023 recession that absolutely did not come. And we're still not in a recession. I don't know if you believe in these rules like the Sam rule, then you're in one. I mean, we'll we'll see. Time will tell on that front. But um, it's been quite a rally. And I think, you know, in the theme of pushing back and going long term here, um, it's been quite some time. You know, it's been quite some time uh, before we've had really a recession or any kind of major pullback that wasn't related to COVID and, you know, 2020 um, and obviously some pretty brutal market in 2022. I think this is my greater point right here. You look at the mean return of the S&P 500 over a very long period of time, right? We're talking 40, 50, 60 plus years. And everyone's going to be trying to fetch that 7 to 9%. I love how, depending on which expert or guru you're talking to, you'll get a different like long-term average of what the S&P 500 can do. But all right, so call it that 7 to 9% there. You're having years that are 25, 30, you know, in the 20s and 30s. You look at 20... 20, 2021, of course, we talked about 2022, and then pop back in 2023 into 2024. These, come on, man. These are all outlier statistics when you're trying to think about mean reversion here. So if we got to give back some to get, you know, that's the thing. It's reversion to the mean. So if we're giving back some here to kind of bring things back to reality and how they function over the long term, then that's what you're getting here. But uh, again, what we're, we're going to see really if the, the innards of the economy are eroding here to throw us into that, you know, that recession. Yeah, just remember, I mean, just a few weeks ago, all the top shops on Wall Street were adjusting their year end forecasts for their targets for the S&P 500. They were all moving them back up. I mean, the whole story yeah. was entirely different, just uh, like we said a few weeks ago. One part about this we didn't talk about, but let's just go ahead and throw it in because it's made a lot of headlines. And I know it's something that our viewers have paid attention to. And I'm curious your take. Warren Buffett and Berkshire selling half of its stake like about Apple. in Apple. Overall, part of an effort here to unload more than $75 billion, we think, in equities in Q2 alone. A reason for concern. Obviously, we don't know exactly uh, what Buffett and, and Berkshire are thinking here. But obviously, when Warren Buffett speaks or moves, um, markets are going to move and certainly people are going to talk about it, Douglas. Yeah, people think he's the de facto Fed at this point, you know, um, just you know, the Oracle here uh, making a big move with his number one position. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is Apple still his number one position? It is right. Even by a long shot. So I would read into that just a little bit before you think he's absolutely bailing on his, you know, uh, on his favor of Apple stock. It's the biggest piece of his portfolio. So he's obviously not bearish on it. But, you know, the flip side is, of course, he's bearish. Just look at exactly how much. Uh, he sold out of that. And I could understand people reading into that here. But I think the bigger question is, all right, what's he going to do with that cash? Right? What are we going to be getting into? And you're going to go in two directions. You know, One, is he looking for discounts to buy stuff he really likes because he's anticipating something? Or did he just run out of his play here on Apple, crushed it, and now it's about looking at other quality companies? Um, it's going to be anyone's game. We'll see what he does here. But that is just one more thing to add to this mix You know, of... of Bad to quasi bad news here is the last thing I think investors wanted to see amid all that's going on is now your guy Warren out here selling his, you know, half of his stake in the, in the number one uh, company. And, and by the way, that's on a lot of. A lot of popular opinions out there that Apple is going to be dominating the AI play, um, given, you know, what they're putting into their iPhone 16 and, um, what they expect, you know, Siri to be able to do. <laughs> Can Siri do it? Um, you know, moving forward, there's a lot of folks that think Apple heads into an AI super cycle on their next phone. So we'll see if Warren got that wrong. Um, as we see the next generation of Apple products come online. Yeah, we know friends like Dan Ives wonder and, and sort of think and put out there, maybe it's a, a bit of a forced upgrade cycle for some of these new offers for something like Apple. So we'll have to kind of see how that goes. Um, a lot of comparisons being made, people reminding us of the flash crashes, 08, Black Monday in 87, obviously some other key dates. Well, what do you think, Douglas, people, long-term investors should really keep in mind? about volatility yes. as it relates to stocks bouncing back from turbulent times. 
Yeah, I love that question because it really has us revisit the plans that we hopefully have in place, you know, uh, self-serving, somewhat biased, if not absolutely biased statement coming from a financial planner. But obviously, I believe in having a financial plan. You don't always need to hire someone to do that. But, you know, whether you're planning on your own or using a financial advisor to help you create that long term plan and cover all the areas of your financial life, you're probably going to fare a lot better than those who are just kind of looking to how their portfolio is doing. Like if you're watching your portfolio data day and making financial decisions based on the balance of your account. I mean, you're just fund- fundamentally messing up how this is supposed to work, right? We want to take a look at how you're doing with cash flow and cash management, protection planning, taxes, retirement, estate, and of course, investment planning as a whole. These all make up uh, the, the puzzle of our financial lives. So um, those who are disciplined and consistent with how they approach their financial lives are going to view moments like these uh, with a lot less emotion than those who haven't done any planning whatsoever. You know, you always come back to the fundamentals, like having a robust cash reserve. I'm a traumatized elder millennial and three to six months just of living expenses in cash just doesn't cut it for me. i rather have six to nine months of my living expenses in cash. I wouldn't even be bothered if someone said they had a year of cash. I know that's a tall ask for a lot of people, but just given, you know, starting our careers in, you know, 2008 to raising kids in a pandemic, You know, it seems like every 10 years we hit some craziness that is very unsettling. Where I really start to worry is on the employment side of things. I think my clients who are generally young and have long-term time horizons can withstand volatility. In fact, they might even be looking for those opportunities as they show up. You can always shorten dollar cost averaging arrangements. So if you're putting money in over the course of a 12-month period and you're looking at 15, 20% discounts in the market, hope you don't get there. But if we do, shorten up that window. Go get that opportunity to buy the thing that you're going to buy anyways. But back to the thing that concerns me the most is when we start seeing income faucets being turned off. I think that's where the long-term investor really starts to have to check their emotions. And we're just not there yet. You know, going from 4.1 to 4.3 on the unemployment isn't quite, you know, it's not the trend we want to see, but it's not screaming everyone's losing their jobs here. So that's the thing I think I look to the most to see just what we need to do more tactically for clients than whether or not the VIX is spiking and there's volatility on the markets. Douglas, it's not a politics podcast but it's sort of impossible to have conversations like this within 100 days of the presidential election and not pay attention to some bad faith finger pointing. I mean, one thing that I think politicians in both parties fall kind of fall victim to is they, especially in, in more recent years, people like to take credit when the markets are good. And then when the markets are bad, they quickly finger point Donald Trump and others are already out there on social media. They call this the Kamala crash. And so I wonder, how would you best advise investors, clients of yours? What what would you want them to remember as they hear this type of political finger pointing, trying to separate noise from single uh, from signal, which ultimately in the world of political rhetoric so close to a heated election, it gets that much harder to really separate what in the world of equities is fact and what is fiction. Yeah, you got 90 to 100% noise coming out of like the political talk when it comes to thinking about your portfolio and how you should invest. Um, you're always going to have, you know, political rivals pointing to the other camp as being responsible for whatever bad news. And they're always going to take credit for whatever good news is happening. And it's just, it's just so silly, right? They're typically pointing back to a time when they weren't even president, or maybe it goes back to their former administration and they were the ones responsible for it. I mean, people's memories are really short and they're just trying to get that sound bit out there and get that jab out there. So we really and, and by the way, like if you're saying you had a bad time over the last uh, four years uh, with Biden, you know, controlling the, you know, with Biden in power and try to compare it to how the market was when Trump was in power. I mean, you have a pretty stellar eight years in here. Sure, some hiccups along the way and some crazy stuff going on. But you're not disappointed if you're a long term investor either way. So keep that in mind. Usually you don't want to get those emotions around politics mixed up into your portfolio. If you're investing for 10, 20 plus year periods of time, how many administrations is that that you're going to be investing? through. So, you know, again, uh, and again, you're, you're talking to someone who, you know, wants to get returns that the market provides, you know, that's generally a passive disciplined and consistent approach to investing. If you can control human, your own behaviors, when things get crazy and wild, that's usually how you're going to win, quote unquote, win the game of investing. You know, if you get lucky by picking up a trade, because you bet on something or for something political or otherwise, it's probably more luck than it really is anything, but not to disparage my uh, colleagues who who do trade for a living and are successful at that. They're they're a rare breed. I do want to ask you finally about the Fed before I let you go, Douglas. Uh, It's always easy to Monday morning quarterback, but I I wonder if you're in the camp that I've heard 
really emerge here the last four or five days that say, well, the Fed clearly should already have lowered rates. They're once again late. And then a follow up to that, any chance you see of it, the an emergency rate cut, which some people are hoping for, or do you think September 18th, the next FOMC meeting is really the ball game when we'll start to look at, uh, at cuts for the first time? It's most likely that you'll get to September and see that 50 basis point cut take place. You know, you can read an emergency cut uh, a number of ways. One is, you know, towards the negative that, wow, things are really worse than we thought or everything that's been said to us up at this point was a lie. Why are we cutting? And now we need an emergency cut to soothe the markets and get equities uh, to bolster. I think that would probably be a little overplayed given the fact that we're not that far off from all time highs here. I could end up eating my words as we see how this develops over the next week or two. Will this just, you know, kind of capitulate here? And, you know, someone someone's going to make a lot of money, perhaps on a VIX trade, you know, this week. We'll see how it pans out by Friday. Um, so I, I would be cautious, you know, if I was you know, thinking about that emergency cut here. I, I think that probably does more more harm than good. Um, I'm sure the knee jerk reaction, if that did happen, would be a rally in the equity markets. But I'm not sure it would sustain itself as those afterthoughts of, all right, well, what's really deteriorating here kind of come into play. And I could see that. I could see those short term gains get taken taken out by a little little longer term losses, like what, a few days later. So no, I'm not here for that. And as far as the Fed being behind the eight ball, I think you can make a pretty good argument for that. You know, um, uh, it, it was, it was, um, you know, last week, I, I was very interested to see if they would sneak in that cut there. Um, and it's kind of ironic that they didn't do it. And now we're dealt, now we're being, you know, forced into dealing with this mess right here. So yeah, Monday morning quarterback easy when you're just a few days after saying, you know, we're a little dovish here. And then all of a sudden things start to unwind, you know, tough, tough, tough job for Jay Powell, man. I've I've been saying for the last few years, I'm like, you know, president's a hard job, but arguably the most difficult job in Washington, DC has been trying to be chairman of the central bank where half the people are mad at you that you started too late. Now everyone else is mad at you because maybe you dragged this on too long. Um, But it's going to be a fascinating, yeah, go ahead. But that's the thing, though, like, you know, there's always there was this big part of me that was higher for longer might be the mantra to be, you know, repeating here. We've been on zero interest rate policy for 15 years. We've been giving the economy, you know, heroin, you know, and, and a drug for so long. You, you got to you got to come down off of that. So I don't quite blame j Powell for, you know, adopting higher for longer here. But now he's kind of watching cracks take shape. So I'd be I'd be happy with that cut in September as opposed to an emergency cut. I, I, I would not be for that. Well, we're out of time here, my man. But I got to say, I speak on behalf of everyone. When you look at the S&P 500 heat map and you see all the scary red, sometimes you really just want a laugh. And there is no Twitter feed or X feed in our world of wealth management that makes me and everyone else laugh harder than at Doug Bonaparte over on X from the man himself, Douglas Bonaparte, president at Bonafide Wealth. Thanks for being here. Thanks, JD. See you soon.